Hi, welcome to the latest episode of NAMI New York State Perspectives. I'm your host, Matthew Shapiro. Boy, do we have a great show for you today. We're joined by our dear friend, Mauro Ronaldo. Mauro is the lead boxing announcer for Showtime Sports, as well as the subject of the acclaimed documentary, Bipolar Rock and Roller, which for my money is the best depiction of what it's like to live with a serious mental illness. Mauro is the recipient of the 2018 NAMI New York State Leader of Mental Health Awareness Award, and the 2019 NAMI Lionel Eldridge Award. Morrow has become a true leader in voicing the fight that those of us with mental health issues face every day. He's a beacon of light for many, and he has demonstrated the power that telling your story can have, not just for those who are listening, but for yourself as well. In this discussion, Morrow holds nothing back and leaves it all on the table. We talk about how the events of 2020 have impacted him, his routine to maintain his mental wellness, and the experience of having a mental illness within an immigrant family. Mauro also discusses how you can have the most serious forms of mental illness and still live out your dream. And of course, I couldn't let Mauro go without him previewing some of the big fights coming up on Showtime and how getting back to work has really helped his recovery. This episode's a real knockout that I know you'll enjoy. All right, so we're here with Mauro Ronaldo the great Showtime Sports Commentator, Showtime Boxing, 2018 uh, NAMI New York State uh, Leader of Mental Health Awareness Honoree. Mauro, how are you? Hey, Matthew. It's very nice to uh, catch up with you in these uh, uncertain times, and especially this week, a week that means a, a lot to a, a lot of us. And I'm, I'm really uh, happy that you gave me a call and, and asked me to come on with you. So I'm, I'm doing better than i have been so you picked the right time to uh to call me up my friend well i'm glad you're doing well and how can we have mental illness awareness week and, and talk about depression screening and all that important stuff without having you here because you know uh the thing that I, i'm always so grateful to you about not just being a great sportscaster of course but really like i say in the tagline of your movie bipolar rock and roller is that every fight needs a voice and you know so many people are struggling. So many people are fighting just to get through every day. And, and you've given a voice to all of us. And, and you opening up and being so honest about your struggles. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I, I saw the movie and being like, wow, this guy has some real cojones on him to, <laughs> to let stuff get filmed that no one would want to see, like be seen in that type of state. So, you know, can you talk about what led you to do that and, and what it's meant to you and the impact it's had? First of all, Matthew, thank you uh, very much for, for what NAMI uh, New York did for me and, and, and just what you guys are, are doing overall. And I know it's, a, uh, it's almost Sisyphean in a way that, you know, you keep, you keep rolling that boulder up the hill and, and we're making so much progress, but it is coming incrementally. So uh, first of all, thank you for what you uh, have done for me and and for uh, people struggling. Even this 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 video cast that you do is is you know so important. So for me in telling my story, it, 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 I always feel like I'm I'm I should be saying something more dramatic than it really was. I I knew it was time. I knew uh, I I've always been very open with my uh, diagnosis because like so many, I fought it when first diagnosed when I was. 19, uh, dragged to emergency, my, but my then girlfriend, because of my behavior, uh, I was a nightclub DJ and I, I, I knew that I was suffering from a severe mood disorder. And that's the other thing, I was very cognizant. I was almost too aware. It was like, I, I really uh, had to realize that this was going to be uh, something that I needed to confront. So when I was diagnosed, like everyone else, how dare you? I'm not crazy, you're crazy, or I don't belong here. This is the nut house. The, every, every stereotype, every uh, stigma that you could imagine came out of me. And then the more I did the research, the more I, because I've always been curious, as you saw in the, in the documentary, the more I read about bipolar affective disorder, which at the time, 1989, was still commonly known as manic depression, I, I was able to determine not only could I have written this, but I was definitely, definitely uh, bipolar. And, and I was very fortunate up to then that it was more the manic, and I say I'm fortunate because there's nothing good about being manic, let's face it. But for me at the time, being a 16-year-old kid put on national television, realizing a lot of dreams, getting this 
constant dopamine, uh, not even an IV, you know, in, in injection. I, I, there was something going on. So for me to tell the story was simply a, a, a way of saying, hey, I've been going through this my entire life. I'm not supposed to be here. I've been down, knocked down repeatedly, uh, just like a boxer, just like a fighter. And I'm here to tell my story to hopefully help one person know that they aren't alone, know that there is help, know that, yeah, when you're at your lowest and you do feel suicidal, there is a place you can turn, you can pick up a phone, you can email someone. There should be no shame. And I guess that's really the reason I'm in, an, I'm in an alpha male business all my life, pro wrestling, boxing, MMA, kickboxing. And it's all about, especially there, you don't want to show weakness. You don't want to show a vulnerability. Uh, I am so grateful that, you know, I'm a, I'm a small timer. I'm a minnow in this uh, sea of whatever you want to call it. Some say celebrity. No, uh, Michael Phelps, greatest Olympian ever. Um, even Dax Prescott, most recently. Incredible uh, what he's so been many. saying. Uh, Kevin Love. Uh, now every NBA league has, or franchise, has a uh, mental health specialist. Um, I, I just wanted to share the story to hopefully get the conversation going even more. And it wouldn't have been possible without my best friend, uh, Harris Usonovic, who uh, I can't state enough. He did 99% of what you see following me for years with his uh, phone, just uh, videotaping me and sometimes with a professional camera because he is a shooter, uh, a storyteller. And, and I said, we need to show everything. Otherwise, what's the point? I don't want this to be a vanity project. Oh, look at this guy, a young kid who lived his dream and announced all this stuff. Nobody cares. I'm an announcer. I, but the story is, yeah, I lived my dreams while living with this debilitating illness. And why? Let me show you in my documentary. And when Steven Espinosa of Showtime tried to protect me when he saw the first cut going, holy, we, we can't do this to him. Like we, This guy's a, got a professional reputation. This is, this is too much. When he was talking about that, he realized, wait a minute, this is why we need to show it. People, even my, my initial, not stigma, but protection, wanting mm -hmm. to protect the vulnerable, wanting to protect the diagnosis. I, uh, that's why, Matthew, mm -hmm. is, is just to give people a voice and, and the reaction. And just even this week, I received uh, an email from someone who said that they were about to kill themselves, were about to uh, complete suicide, something I picked up at the uh, NAMI conference. We don't commit suicide, you, you complete it. And uh, even talking about it just makes me very emotional. Mm -hmm. He said he came across the documentary by happenstance and after watching it and, and hearing what was at the end, and I'm so glad that I'm, I was caught in, on camera saying what I said because it has been my mantra. Mental health is a life sentence for most of us. It does not have to be a death sentence. And those words made him feel better. And so what do you do when you get emails like that? That's, mm -hmm. that's to me, it's, it's, I want to put together a care package, and you can help me with this too. I want to put together uh, contact information, uh, a, pack, a care package for people who not only contact me, but who, who just need it whether we put it together in a sense like, it's almost like uh, when there's an earthquake and you have your emergency kit, when you're in crisis, when you need just anything, whether it's a security blanket, I, I'm really serious and, and coming out of the fog that I recently came out of, uh, I, I've been thinking more and more about that. I, I feel I still don't do enough for the cause. That's always the amazing thing about you. And, and, and I've noticed this in so many different ways. And I don't know if it's, it's, a, it's a bipolar thing, but I suffer from it too. Like, I hate watching myself, you know, one of these episodes, even though doing these episodes have been the most incredible thing in my journey during this very difficult time. I've learned so much, but I always see the negatives in it. Oh, I miss saying that. I miss saying, I should have brought that up. I remember the last time we were actually physically together in Seattle, you had just done a Bellator um, uh, card a few nights before. We were talking about how great it was. And you're like, yeah, but I missed this one thing and you couldn't let it go. And, and so can, can you kind of talk about that that aspect of, of not feeling like you're good enough, even though it, it's gotta be hard too, because you've accomplished your dreams, right? You've done everything you want, you got where you are, and then you look around, it's always that weird feeling, right? Great question, Matthew, and, and, and really well, well articulated, and absolutely, and it is a bi, well, 
it's a bipolar thing. I hate labeling everything, uh, but it's also for me just, I think the childhood uh, issues that I faced and you know, the, the, the relationship I had with my, uh, m my father at the time and knowing again, you know, I grew up in the seventies uh, and, and while well, born in 1969. Yeah. So my formative years were, were the seventies. My God, I'm 50 years old, Matthew. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Brother. Well, well, you just um, told I, everyone the secret. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I've always been a perfectionist. There is no doubt about that, whether it's from birth, whether it's from, uh, the being told you're a fit, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. And maybe that's part of it. The fear of failure. Uh, it's, it's cliche, but yeah, I'm wanting to impress my father, wanting to prove him wrong and, and having successfully done that, but yet not responding with, uh, vitriol, but instead, instead love and support both financially and otherwise, and being able to do that. The greatest gift I have ever been able to give every, anyone. And I think the moment that I, I really, and I'll get back to the criticism thing. This is the bipolar. See, you guys ask me a question and I'll ramble off in tangents. I'll, I'll try to come full circle for you, Matthew, but uh, I'll try I paid to bring off you back. Don't mortgage. worry. I, I, I paid off my parents' mortgage and I was able to do so before the age of 50. And I'm only, the only reason I'm sharing this with you and your, and your viewers is I did it having been hospitalized, uh, you know, a total of 13 times now and, and still having the support. And so for me being negative is because I still feel, why me? Why are you giving me all the support? Why is Showtime keeping me employed? Why did I, I realize my dream of, of making it to WWE? Why do I get to do everything at the highest level and more than most, like, and being consistent as they say at it? I don't know. And so I think part of the, and you're right, I will never watch any, I have issues watching other people do my job. I, I have issues now watching boxing commentators, MMA commentators, pro wrestling commentators, no problem listening to hockey or football or basketball, but I bet if I ever did those sports again, I might do the same thing. I feel like I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And I hear someone and I go, damn, so much better. And yet, all of a sudden, I'm reminded, uh, Moral, they're trying to probably be you. You. These young these guys are yeah. coming up. They, and, and honestly, having been introduced to some of these people, I'm immediately ashamed of my, my judgment or my thoughts because they're usually incredibly nice and, and look, you know, look up to me. They want to show their respect. So I'm like, wow. Uh, but yeah, the criticism is, is always been there. Mm -hmm. I believe it's part of my success and drive is the fear of failure. And uh, already feeling I'm failing this interview because I'm um, rambling from the start, brother. No, I would cut you off if you were really rambling. I'm hanging on every word. But I, I, I want to touch on something else you, you kind of touched on, which I think is interesting. So you talked about your dad, right? And, and of course, this is something we haven't really talked about, but you come from an immigrant family in, in, in yes. kind of rural Canada, you know, to you know, immigrant families as a whole and, and rural communities as a whole don't generally have the greatest understanding about mental health issues. So that right had to have been a real struggle too. And part of that validation with your parents, like they probably never really, eventually they did, because you see it in the movie, right? But when all this first started, I mean, you were pushing back, you gotta be crazy. I can't imagine what was going through their head. So it, how much of that validation, because we talk about it a lot at, at NAMI actually, the supporting families that, a lot of families who have a loved one with serious mental illness, they're the grieving process, right? They, that, that loved one will ne may never accomplish what the dreams that the parents may have had for them, if you know what I mean. So Amen. you talked about that immigrant family experience and how you were able to communicate your needs and get that resonated with your family. It, it took me until the documentary. So that's how long, <laughs> early 40s. Um, but growing up, and great question again, I love this. Um, yeah, my father, uh, and again, no excuses, nothing. It was abuse, it was what it was. And, and, and yet, I hate to say it, but it was commonplace at the time. And, and yet, I, my parents, I, you know, I was talking to Frank Shamrock earlier today. My dad never made a lot of money, ever, a year. And yet, he has a, a farm, and he's had it for 50 years that's now, you know, valued over a million dollars. And so my father had the work ethic. My father had the drive, but my father had his issues. My mom, I believe there's depression in the family for generations that was always swept under the rug. And, and, and not being, you know, being a hypersensitive child, I knew there was something deeper 
especially about me and, and being told that I wasn't good enough at times or not being the, the man, you know, wants to mow the lawn and do the hand hard work like my younger brother actually had no issues with and my other brother too. Like I was, I was the, the, the hypersensitive dreamer. I was the artistic one. I was a voracious reader. I, I, I was doing what I thought was for me and I knew it was, but being told by people who are supposed to love and protect you that you're, you're not good enough. And this is my father. My mom did what she could, and my mom has always been there for me. And, and you're right, there is a constant grieving process. And even today, now living in California, they being in Vancouver, where they, you know, my father, for the first time ever, Matthew, and this just happened a few weeks ago, I think it was when my mother was rushed to the hospital, and it, was, it wasn't good. It didn't look good. And and I talked to my dad and we don't, he never answers the phone. I rarely have conversations with my father. Like it's incredible that for many others, you'd say, well, you probably don't have a dad then, right? I'm like, no, he, I do, but it's just the way it's always been. He answered the phone that morning. And for the first time ever, he says, I'm, you know, we're proud of you, son. Thank you, man. You've done a hell of a lot for us. You've done, you know, you give me too much money. You, you do a lot. And I'm like, wow, that's a powerful moment and yet it was because I wonder if it was because my mom was in hospital maybe the you know the mortality he's 75 now not in great health and you you wonder but for me the 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 my family has accepted it obviously and and so much so thanks to, and there's another reason I did the movie I believe really honestly is and I think that's what it represents for everyone who's seen it I, I get goosebumps because they go hey you gotta watch this Okay, yeah. mom, you got to see what I'm yeah. going through. This, this guy shows it pretty well here. And so for my family, there was that as well. My, my dad, I don't know if he'll ever truly understand it, but he, a little more empathy, a little more sensitivity. Uh, mom has been the greatest and my mom has gone through hell. And, and she, has, she suffers from clinical depression. My, my, her, my aunt's on her side. Like my grandmother, who was 43 when she had her mom, she, uh, my mom was named after her brother, her, she had two brothers and then sisters. And the brothers were in their mid teens and it was during the war time, maybe just after the war in Italy, uh, World War II. And they went to get firewood or they were playing in the forest with a couple of their friends. And um, one of them stepped on a landmine, oh instantly my. killing him. And then the shrapnel hit my other uncle. So he was dead. And then my grandmother, Philomena had to go and, you know, collect what was left to, to bury. So the trauma, and I mean, all of us, this is the other thing about mental illness. It's, it's due to trauma, my man. And I, you know, we all go through our fair share, especially now during the pandemic. So, and, and there are a lot of grieving now there are, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's normalizing this the way it needs yeah. to be unfortunately normalized because it exists. It is a, uh, it is one of the biggest health issues right now facing all of us. So that's, yeah, the grieving process, I think, never heals. And, and, and that's why I had to come to terms too, Matthew, that this is chronic. People can say, well, you know, you're having a good day today, right? Yeah, parts of it. And the only reason I'm talking to you today is because I have, it's become a full-time job. I'm walking like I've never walked. I'm walking more than Socrates and Plato. I'm, I'm doing things. I'm at the water. I paid to be here. I'm, I'm lifting weights every day when I don't want to. Um, my one issue still is eating. I, I tend to eat healthy, but I love my sugar. I mm. love my candy binges. And I know if I have those, then you've got to put in the work immediately and go yeah. right away. So I've lost some weight and I do see, uh, I meditate a bit. I play my music, brother. I play yeah, my so keyboard <laughs> and just loving it, man. And I, I'm talking about all this because it's also, I want people to hear it and, 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 and you know, put it in their lives, their way, because it's, it's, it's not, it's not just a opinion. It's fact, mm. exercise, talk therapy. I'm with a therapist mm. weekly. Um, and oh boy, by the way, I spent more money than I would have ever thought. And, and having said that, um, the American health system, uh, regardless of what else is happening in the world, the American health system is a disgrace to those with mental illness and a disgrace in general. i am come from Canada, people say social medicine, blah, blah. No, it, it has its issues too. But what I paid six figures for, Matthew, 
Um, I'm not a, I'm not overly rich. I'm a, right. I'm doing well by my sta you know, by standards right. and especially for a person suffering or living Good. with bipolar. But I had to pay six figures for what I could have gotten free in my, my home and native land. People could say, well, why do you go there? I was with the best. I was with yeah. the Avengers of therapy. I'm not yeah. lying. It's called yeah. Camden International. I'm going to give them uh, a free plug because they are amazing people. Okay. And, and I think, you know, they are in line with what NAMI, they, they, they are very respectful of NAMI. I, I couldn't believe, and I told them in therapy too, millions of people need this kind of treatment. Why are we charging so much effing money? And why aren't there, you know, systems in place to save these people's lives? Matthew, it doesn't take a lot. You know that. It takes a phone call sometimes. It takes one person, and you said that, you know, that, that you've been that one person for people, and your friend was that one person for you, and, and that, you know, that we all need those people, you know. It's so interesting. When professional support is so hard to get for anyone, I mean, and you talked, you put that so eloquently, you know, you're, you're blessed that you have the means to be able to get the best health care, and, and so many aren't, and, and, you know, it's interesting. One of our, this year's, uh, Mental Health Award winners or awareness winners, Lily Cornell Silver, uh, Chris Cornell's daughter, who's doing amazing. Yes, work. amazing, <laughs> amazing family, man. God bless her. It, God bless her. And, and you know, but that's what you said. You know, she's like, when this all starts, she's like, here I am. I have all these resources. I can I have family. I have friends. I have access to the best therapists in the world. But I'm feeling lost right now. So she took it upon herself, like you did to open up, tell her story, talk. I mean, right in the first episode, in a very in-your-face way of her show, of talking about what it's like to be a suicide surviving family and, and you know, that experience. So, you know, it's so important when to know what resources are out there that, you know, like you said, all of NAMI's programs are offered for free. Oh, I promote NAMI ad nauseum, my friend. It's, it's my go-to and it's not even, I, I don't care. This is the thing. There's no competition here. I don't care what it is. Get the if you need to do something to help, please. By all means, I I I guess that's the other point, and I I why I support NAMIs because you you are consistently establishing chapters across the country, and that's what it's is needed. This has to be national. I know I'm a boxing commentator. I know how much we all wish there was a national governing body and one champion in each weight class. <laughs> well, in NAMI, we have a champion in each city, yeah. and 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 all it needs is people like yourself and maybe, um, you know, I'll take some, I'll, I'll say, yeah, people like myself to just care. And, and it's not just going out of your way or I have, you know, I'm trying to pay the bills. I'm trying to keep my family uh, with a roof over their head. And yes, and that's why you need it. We have to be a community. And I can't tell you how healing it is. I thought group therapy was gonna be the worst thing for me. I'm like, I'm here for me. I hate to be selfish. I'm paying a lot of freaking money and God bless you guys. And unfortunately, I'm an empath, so I'm going to absorb all of your. And you know what came out of that? People outside of it go more. You're such a. Thank you for being in this group because you just you bring it. You're not here to screw around. You you go right to where your source of pain is, and I'm. And that's the thing we need to be able to do that. And we're we're slowly getting there. Mm -hmm. I I think that's why people like Lily and and you talk about voices. Her father was uh, one of the greatest voices in rock history. And, and, again, and, and my really, Lord. just as you're voicing the fight, I mean, he was talking about mental health issues and, and his struggles. Yes, that's I mean, why Chester Benny, they, yes. listen to the music. That's, this is the other thing. Even today's music, I'm a, a middle-aged hip-hop head. I still love hip-hop and rap. I got my 18-year-old and 16-year-old nephews keeping me, uh, you know, up to date. And, and we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're really connecting on that level. So, but they're, I listen to the lyrics and holy shit, they, pardon me, they're, uh, they're talking about opioids, depression, Juice World, who we lost. We're losing a lot of the younger voices that I yeah. think we're going to propel the, the mental health conversation. A lot of them to violence, obviously, but also mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe uh, those are, that's the generation. My, my nephew tells me he loves me all the time. And he's an 18 year old kid, really good looking guy, very artistic into fact, but it's natural to them. And I'm like, thank goodness, maybe the next generation is gonna make it much easier for men, women, anyone, uh, they yeah. to, to uh, you know, all of us to just 
give each other respect. One thing I, I try to do, and it's scaring me in America. I'm a guy, Matthew, I'll, uh, in a mask, whatever we're wearing, the, the, I try to connect with people on the sidewalk. And more and more in California, in America, and I get it, but just, there's, they don't want to connect. I'll say hi, they walk right by, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge they don't. I mean, when it, when yeah. it does happen, it's a beautiful thing, and that's why. It's a good pause, because I want to touch on a couple of things that you kind of brought up. So you were talking, and well, very powerful listening to you talk about the trauma in your family. And, and mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. trauma, we say mental health, mental illness isn't contagious, but I think it is in some ways with trauma, and trauma begets trauma, right? And, and, and you talked about Steven Espinoza earlier, and, and when he first, um, you know, president of Showtime Sports, and, you know, to give you and, and, you know, all the credit in the world, you know, people like you who want to tell your stories, but Showtime for giving you and, and Meta World oh, Peace, that's incredible, because that story is pretty raw, too, and oh, talking that's... about... You know, we talk about adverse childhood experiences all the time. And of course, we're Let's actually giving an award to Meta this year too, but that movie really shows you how trauma begets trauma and, and how that impacts someone throughout their life. So really so much credit has to go to Showtime Sports and, oh, and, 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 I would and, put, and Brian Daly for yeah, Brian Daly, that's telling what I these stories. As well. But it's their, their family. I, I can't overstate it enough. It's not supposed to happen in our business, unfortunately, which again, hopefully is changing. A cutthroat, toxic uh, environment, a lot of egos in, 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 on television, broadcasting, entertainment, call it what you will. But at Showtime, we, and, and I can't state enough, the support I've received, Steve Varad right there, mm -hmm. and, and Al Bern, everyone, Al Bernstein, Brian Custer, our, our on-air team, we're, we're different people. It's not like we're best friends out mm -hmm. of the, the thing. We keep in touch, but when it's Showtime, we're, we're there as a team. We're wanting to respect each other, and, uh, and I hope the chemistry shows. But, yeah, Showtime went above and beyond, and I believe, again, a company like that, Viacom, CBS, and, and getting behind my, my story and, and others. I think Showtime Sports, and, I, yeah, I'm biased. Uh, mm -hmm. Their documentaries are incredible. Yeah. And there's a, I, I'm a doc guy anyway. I, I, I try to watch a documentary a day. It's, it's, it's just, you know, what I, I'm about. But I'm so glad there's so many documentaries now about mental health. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we're raising the bar constantly, yeah. production-wise. Lady Gaga, come yeah. on, man. It's, uh, she just did an know, interview we're, on we're, CBS we're Sunday morning. We're again, she just did an interview on CBS Sunday morning. It's like two weeks ago. It's fantastic. I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, where you know, she could, here she is at the height of her fame is when she was at her lowest of the lows. And, and you know, it's like she, she kind of was a victim of her own success in that, you know, as she put it, Lady Gaga took over Stephanie. And, and yes. you know, that's, and, and, and you kind of talk about that too. And I, I think there's a similarity there where, you know, Staten Island's not exactly, a, you know, rural Canada, but, but growing up in that kind of environment where you feel invalidated and, and, and a lot of that time, like me, you know, it's, it's that mental health issue. I mean, I was diagnosed three and a half years old. And wow. you, you carry that with you throughout your life, like you, you and I were saying. Oh, God, and, yeah. And you could be at the, the peak of peak of fame. I mean, you don't get much and, bigger than Lady Gaga. And, you know, yeah. she steps off that stage and, and she feels like it's almost like that great scene in, in the movie where it was after the, the May, Mayweather-McGregor uh, fight and you're talking to your mom and, and you're coming down from that oh and god see, yeah you are right after one of the biggest professional achievements of your career one of the biggest calls up to that time and you walk away from the arena and it's like and and that happened repeatedly and guess what it's not happening uh, half as much anymore uh, uh during so glad during recent that. but you know what i have to say unfortunately the the pandemic has impacted me and I, I've heard this. Thankfully, I'm not the only one reading media. There is a calm about a lot of people with mental health issues right now because it's like the whole world is under duress mentally. And there is mental health issues everywhere. What I'm saying is the conditions have allowed me to be better. The, the airports are empty. No anxiety there. Planes, they're, they're above and beyond clean and the service is extra nice. No triggers there. I guess that's the word. I've there are not a lot of triggers I'm facing lately. And, and for that, it's allowed me 
while they're at bay, it's allowed me to strengthen the resolve, strengthen the, 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 the self-talk, you know, in a positive fashion. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, this reason why we're doing this interview now. I think we, we wanted to do this sooner, and I wasn't in a good place. And honestly, this is one of the rare interviews I probably will give because it's still something I'm working on, but uh, interviews give me anxiety. Mm. Well, we're so grateful for you for doing this, of course. And, and it's interesting, too. I, I mean, and that was really the idea with this show and starting this series is that people with living with mental illness and, and family members supporting loved ones with mental illness, we're used to crisis. We never know when crisis is going to hit. We never know how long the crisis is going to last. So we well learned a, a, an interesting type of resiliency, and it's really been my mm -hmm. goal to highlight that resiliency and, and what we can learn from each other as people with lived experience and how the general public who's kind of coming around to a, being new to a crisis can learn a lot from people uh, living with the mental illness. It's funny, I interviewed one of my interns and she said, yeah, she's very upfront about having borderline personality disorder. And she goes, I'll tell you what, thank God I had so much DBT training because that's what got me through this. It's like the perfect thing. So, you know, you touched about how the journey has been tough, and I know we've been trying to do it, wanted to do this for a while. But as all of us have tried to get some form semblance of normal, so we have like these little touch tone moments, like you know, the first time going into the supermarket, or for so many families now, it's sending their kids back to school. It's these very nerve wracking, should be bittersweet moments. But for you, going back to work, I, I, I want to talk to that a little bit because you know, Showtime's done an excellent job putting together some great cards lately. But, you know, again, and you talked about it, it had to have been nerve wracking flying across the country. I, I think I told you this back in the spring. I had one of the worst panic attacks I've ever had in a supermarket when this was beginning, just felt it on your chest, you know? So, but, you know, and you go through these processes, it's like kind of dipping your toe in the water. So getting back to work and, and you're having to fly across the country, but working how, how has that helped you oh, through this the fact there was a few months off and again being in a position where the months away from my work uh, were you know i was still in a good place financially and and um you know i i've recently taken measures to to improve the the balance between work and my life and uh, made some big time decisions there. But in terms of and going you back- big, first, We don't have to get into the decision you made, but I'm very yeah, proud but, of you because you put yourself first. And I you recognize that. that, you know, it was a, a something that you would want for a long time, you achieved it, but you knew when you had to walk away for it because you, you're putting yourself first. And that, that's an important yeah. lesson and I'm proud and, of you and for it. Yeah, it was triggering a lot of, uh, anxiety just because I cared about it so much too. So anyway, going back to the Showtime experience, man, oh man, it was, it was incredible to just be back with everyone knowing for the, that was the first time many of the crew was getting a paycheck, made me feel very good for them. And that's the thing, uh, not overstating it. And I get, I'm so glad when I get to talk about this, the moment I get to Showtime, uh, there's, there's, there's Angie and Nikki who handle our travel into production there's there's so many people, uh, Gordon Hall, like there's this there's this crew of individuals that don't get the credit, whether the cameramen, the audio, and we're always joking. We're 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 we're, we're a family. We talk. We we ask about each other's families. It's not. I've been for the most part my career. Most that doesn't happen. You want it to happen, but it's just really official, or or you feel the negative energy from a hype, you know, big time ego or whatever. Uh, so going back to Showtime, first of all, was an incredible experience. And, and another thing about the pandemic that, again, turns into a, uh, I hate to use the word positive, but help me. Yeah. We had to stay in our hotel room. No right. meetings, no having to go and intermingle with public. Or what, and I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Like, I just get to focus on your, work. You know, being in, in Mohegan Sun, you just come down the elevator, you're right there. It's got to be. That's, and, and that's the thing. So I, I stayed in my room. It gave me more time to prep. And that's the other thing. Everything, the changes I have made in my life this year uh, in order for me to uh, uh, continue my self-care mm. is um, allowed me to not be as stressed, to not be as anxious, to not trigger myself into a deep depression 
or mania. The mania is still there. I feel it even in this interview. And, and that's the thing about live TV, too, as Al Bernstein uh, so eloquently put it in, in the documentary when he said, you know, there's just a natural high to live TV. Yeah. There's no net. And I'm like, yeah, I get to do this. So you're already seeing that's the thing, the body language at ringside, mm -hmm. you're getting it now. So it's right. not manufactured, Matthew. Right. It's not fake. This is who I am. Right. And I know it's not for everyone, but I believe the one good thing about the doc, and I hope this not just for me, but for others, it will allow people to go, wait a minute, maybe that's what my friend is going through. Yeah. Holy shit, maybe that's what mom is doing. Maybe that's what my brother's about. Look at this guy. He's, he's like that, but then look what he does. <laughs> This is, and, this I, is, and I've told you too. We have, you know, one of our members who who came up to me. I, I text you. It was actually the night before that canceled Bellator fight that you had come to Mohegan Sun for. But that she said, you know, she came up to me. You're friends with Mar, right? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, he saved my life and saved my relationship with my parents. I sat my parents wow. down. They watched the movie and and they understood me for the first time. But. See. Talking about your Showtime family, like, you know, as a friend, I've been concerned about, you know, it's been a bumpy ride, but that first, first card that you guys had, they had that little, it was only about 10 seconds before the opening where it was kind of a behind the scenes and, and you're joking around, oh, yeah. a hard time about the hair, but that <laughs> made me feel so good because I got to see, I was like, oh, my friend is doing okay. And then seeing, that was like the first time I'd actually seen you. I mean, we'd be texting or whatever, but seeing you as you doing what you love and, and being okay really made me feel you know who you can credit for that is david dinkins who has become a, a a big brother figure a mentor he's the executive uh, producer for showtime sports he's the guy who first hired me or, or recommended to hire me i think he did you know yeah, make the final he, decision at the time with the powers that be uh but he he really and I think the documentary also shifted his perspective in many ways about who I am, what I'm dealing with, but, but also in general for him and how he deals with, with people in his life. So he and I have become very close and he, he said it. And again, right away, I'm like, well, can we involve, you know, everybody more? Like, uh, it seems like I'm the focus and I don't, Mo, this is, you know, we want to, this, there's a reason you are, you know, the Showtime guy. And, and it's like you said, it's an opening scene to say, Hey, great to see everybody while we're doing the protocol we're getting you know tested or, or and it's like wow the first time we're seeing each other yeah. so i'm glad you're right and it made uh, i i've been really yeah i've been impressed with so much since we came back knowing again what the real world is dealing with like i i'm concerned sometimes i'm a big time uh, follower of the numbers in in tv and stuff and again part of the 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 insecurity part of the like, oh my God, I'm going to lose all my jobs. Oh my God. Oh my God. The, you know, ratings aren't where they should be. But then you read this week, I read uh, game one of the NBA final with LeBron James and the upstart heat. Uh, what is it? Uh, half of the, you know, audience last year, lowest rated Stanley mm -hmm. cup in 2007, two of the MLB wildcard games under a million. This is not to pick on them. This is to show me and other, everyone. There was stuff that's more serious than stuff we love right now. Yeah, but you think that 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 kind of out? I mean, for me, sports coming back. I mean, was oh. was huge. But I, I gotta tell you something too, because I've wanted to ask you. I was always a little nervous. Hearing you talk about David Dinkins Jr. makes me so happy. This is a true story. I've always asked. I wanted to ask Kelly was as a boss, and I'm not surprised to hear your answer. When I was in high school, between my junior year and senior year of high school. I was interned on his father's campaign. You know, his father was uh, well, mayor of, of New York City. And, Amazing. And, and during that time, during that summer, my, my father passed away. And um, we were doing an event in front of City Hall, and, and the guy I was working for said, can you come here? And I had never, I'd met Mayor Dinkins a couple of times, very much in passing, you know, not really talking to him but, but he wanted i guess my, the guy i worked for i told the mayor my father had just passed away this was like my first day back and he wanted to pull me aside and offer his condolences and someone wow. said, i was a little intern on the campaign you know nothing and, and i'll never forget that and you know that little That's bit awesome. of humanity is is it's like what we say what you can do for another human being is an amazing thing and i'm glad to and, hear and it, what did it take trauma Five gets passed on that goodness gets passed on too absolutely and that's the simple we I, I don't know if we we talked about this before we started recording or not but i i'm 
I'm starting to worry more and more only because coming from Canada, I know no, there's a stereotype. We're all friendly. We're, we're all too, you know, very nice. But no, it's, it's there. There's issues there too, in terms of race, in terms of everything that's in America, they're there, maybe less so, but it's there. Uh, but I'm a guy again, just if you make contact with a fellow human being, especially now walking on the sidewalk, say hello. I, I, it's, it's so disheartening how many times I say hi or acknowledge and they just ignore you. And I know we're all suffering. I know it, that mm -hmm. this is how we can show each other a bit of humanity and then the, the reaction happens. It's a chemical reaction. Yeah. They'll do it to someone else. And before you know it, we're picking each other up and we're, we're continuing to fight the good fight, as mm -hmm. I, I said in the, in the documentary. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm glad that you experienced that with Mayor Dinkins and, and his son is, like I say, it's been, he's the reason I'm, I'm where I'm at in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. on this rung of the ladder, because there have been, again, from Boss Rutan to Frank Shamrock to uh, Harris Usanovic to, to my family, hey, my support network, I, I want to share it. I want to cut pieces off for mm -hmm. other people who don't have it, because it's, it's so important. Right. So, I mean, we've been talking about Showtime. We're almost out of time. I could talk to you all day, but we got to talk about some of the big cards. Hopefully, we'll have sure. some boxing fans who've listened to us talk about mental health for a while. So, talk about some of the big fights Showtime has coming up. Obviously, the big we just had the Charlo doubleheader, which was fantastic. You guys did an amazing job. and Thank you. The Charlo twins certainly did an amazing job. They both look really good. You know, Adrian, what do you think is next, especially for Jamal, the you know the heavier one? It, do you think he's ready for uh, someone like Canelo yet? Well, politically, obviously, there's there's difficulties, and that's something else that you know, unfortunately, we all deal with in the sport of boxing: the the fragmentation, the you know, the the, the television deals, the the promoting. Yeah. But I I believe so. I mean, coming off a victory like that over Dervianchenko, question is, will Canelo? come to back to 160 and, yeah. and he's got other unfortunately he's got his own issues right now yeah. legally with uh, his network and his, his promoter yeah. but in terms of in ring I mean there's there's really that's the thing for for Jamal he needs a, another big name maybe he yeah. needs a triple G uh, yeah. which again other side of the street as they say but but it was an incredible was it spectacular no if he could have finished Dervianchenko Tough that would have definitely finish. increased the stop, but Dervianchenko's as durable as they come. He took some and, and big punches war, in that fight. Oh my gosh! And the war with Triple G, the, the the fight with Daniel Jacobs. So yeah. I thought it was a great effort for Jamal Charlo in proving that you know the move to middleweight was right. He up to then he'd been five and zero with three knockouts, but against less than yeah. formidable opposition. But I believe he answered the first big test and. And I wish I could give you more in the clear mm -hmm. path, but that's the thing with boxing. It's, it's, it's so hard. You don't know what's next. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, I think Jamel has some more options because, you know, there's a lot of oh, BBC guys. Oh, my goodness. What like a treasure see, trove. I'd like to see, yeah, will you yeah, fight uh, Jared Hurd down the line? There's so many options for him, but he's, you know, definitely the, the, the big dog in that division now. It's so rare when you get number one versus number two. So mm -hmm. thank you guys for putting that together. And, of course, we have another big, big uh, uh, pay-per-view coming up the night after our education conference. We have Jonathan Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz. How do you see that one shaping up? Well, it's, again, the biggest uh, name on uh, Javante Davis's ledger, and he's become not only in ring, but what a connection he has made to the audience. This young kid who, of course, is all about the – the hip hop scene, the pop culture scene. And, and he's, he's obviously made a connection with the crowd because he has done well in his hometown of Baltimore. He's done well in Atlanta. Atlanta. Uh, every, anywhere he goes, he, he you know, puts in a, a huge house, uh, a crowd. And so uh, his knockout power is incredible. He's, he's, a, he's a mini Tyson with his punching yeah. power. But there are questions that need to yeah. be asked. Uh, what is he going to be like against a... Uh, a level of a Leo Santa Cruz who this is who's, more of a, a you know a fighter versus a boxer type situation. Yes, and the high fight. volume of Santa Cruz. Yeah. I mean, he'll come at you in waves. He throws a thousand punches every fight. Doesn't have the power of a yeah. Davis. Also has a few more miles on that proverbial odometer. Um, this is exactly that. This Santa Cruz has to be able to swarm Gervonta Davis, disrupt his rhythm, uh, unsettle him, try to keep him off balance. Uh, I know there's the, the weight coming down, like there's the two titles at stake, yeah. but it's a lower weight. So, so Davis is going I, down and, and Santa Cruz no, is going Santa, up, uh, right? Yeah. 
I believe yeah, so. Yeah, I think that's how it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> and you know what? That's the other thing. I, I tend to compartmentalize. Everyone asks what the process is, research. How come you can know all this about so much? A lot of it is just compartmentalization. And, and knowing that that fight is now, uh, I believe it's going to be October 31st when all is said and done. I know it's supposed to be the 24th, but again, the, is everything's actually, is up moving in the air. To Texas? Does that look like yeah, it's actually going to it's, it's, mm. there's, there's so much going on. Welcome yeah, I think the maybe the news the today might also, I mean, we were actually yeah, recording this today that um, we found out President Trump has coronavirus. So I wonder how that might impact things with that talking political, but people are going to be more careful now. I, I, I don't know. But, you know, one of the other ones I, I, I said that I'm really excited about that, that Showtime has coming up, one of my one, all-time favorites. We have uh, Nanito Denaire coming up in December, too, uh, coming off just uh, an amazing fight oh. in a way, which as we t- were talking earlier, I thought that was the fight of the year last year. So Oh, it was. And, and Obali is in a tough competition, too. So, again, we have a number one versus a number two. So... How do you see that one? Yeah, well, Ubali has earned uh, his stripes of very much a, a smooth operator. And, and Nonito Donaire with that incredible, was it his last stand against a guy pound for pound, one of the most devastating punchers, yeah. an incredible fighter in Nooya Inoue. Yeah. Uh, did it, what, again, I have to ask, Donaire was, what, we, people were expecting him to be beaten uh, pretty easily by a yeah. guy like Inoue at this stage of his career. But yeah. uh, Donaire... I have to wonder if that was his last stand or was he now even more motivated? And again, COVID, the layoff can help some people. Mm. We're coming off a lot of fighters with career long layoffs. Uh, Some of them uh, were injured others. Yeah. Maybe there's ring rust. Maybe it was too much of a layoff, but for Nonito Donaire at his age and and the battles that he's been through, uh, it's going to be interesting how he and Ubali mesh. I I believe that's a, a hardcore fans, uh, you know, a fight they're looking forward yeah. to, and I am as well. There'll be a lot of punches thrown in that one. You know, oh, gosh, yeah. that. That's going to be amazing. So I'm interested, just one last kind of boxing question. So from a fan's perspective, I've actually really liked the empty arenas. You could hear the trainers. You could hear the punches. You feel like you're there. Do you see do you see it affecting the fighters at all? Like the, the energy level? I think so. A little bit of ring rust, a little bit of not having that same – Amped energy I think mentally for some it does, but once the bell rings, uh, it's a fight. And I agree with you. There's uh, a lot that I do like uh, in terms of the, the sounds and the, the, you hear the coaches uh, more. And there's more of the professional ambiance, um, even though always trying to improve, lay out a little more, let the action speak for itself. As an announcer, you want to try to do that. I don't know how successful we are, but um, yeah, it's different. I, again, someone who lives with uh, mental illness, I, I, I'm, maybe that's part of the reason I'm not as anxious. There's, there isn't an yeah. audience full of people, but they're missed because they pay the bills and, and mm. for the fighters too, they, they give them energy. So I, I don't, you know, I, I understand plans are to put fans in, in Texas for the uh, Davis Santa Cruz pay-per-view and we'll see how that goes. And I mean, there's a lot of like Texas people on the undercard. Oh, the protocol you got to go through again, kudos to Showtime and, and everyone, what they did to put together the fight sphere with Bellator MMA. And, and obviously, we've seen all sports, so COVID is impacting everything. And so I just hope, um, you know, we continue to wear our masks. We continue to socially distance. This is not political. This is common sense. And uh, do what we can to help each other more. It's, it's, we need, uh, especially this week, Mental Health Awareness Week, uh, a chance for all of us. We're giving you a a, a reason to talk mental health. It's right. Mental Health Awareness Week. Right. And, and again, and today we, we, we are going to uh, air this on Depression Screening Day. So again, you know, you said it at the beginning, it's so hard to accept when you start to notice those symptoms. But listen to your body. Listen to yourself. If, you, if you're feeling something off, it's as Mara has shown, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's nothing to be ashamed oh. about. Get that help. Get screened and, and address these issues because they are treatable. And, and, and you can have the worst of the worst and still be at the top of, of your, your respective game like Mauro here. And, and well, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Go finish, please. Well, it's just about you really, you're paving the way for so many. You're such an inspiration. And, and like I said, 
uh, you know, I, we say it all the time when we encourage people to tell your story, it helps you as much as it helps other people. So we're just so grateful for all that you've done and, and really leading the way and, and voicing our fight. Well, it goes right back to you guys. And honestly, and this is again, not to, to whatever people always say, I got to learn to give myself credit and things, but you, I mean, I, I did what I did and I'm grateful and I'm, I'm glad I did because it did help me as much as anyone. But the fact that it's it spawned so much conversation and and helps so many people in the most dire circumstances just leads me to believe if everyone did just their little part, they'd be the my story is their story, and and so and I've been so grateful for everything Nami continues to do. You are the you know organization that I I send people to. I have to admit there are letters that I get, emails that leave me so emotionally drained that. I don't know how to respond. They are, they are so articulate, heartfelt. I know so much was put into it. And at times I just don't find the time or even the energy to just so I try to respond. I think that's part of it. I, I hope the connection that I make that I did read, I, I'm here. And then I give the NAMI uh, info or the, the crisis line number. And, and just, I mean, even that, that, that that's enough. No, that's an, and listen, it's one of my favorite quotes, to save a life is to save a generation. It's from Elie Woo! Wiesel, and, and you're saving lives, Mauro, and, and, and you're making such a big difference. Now, we're grateful for you and, and for all that you've done and, and for taking the time to really talk and, and dig deep with us today. Uh, there's Amen. a lot more we'll have to have talked about. Maybe we'll have to well, we could before. do it again on the road, brother. All right. Well, God will, and, and just thank you. And continue to be well and, and, and taking it day by day and, and leading by example. We're just so grateful for everything you do. We love you. You're the best. And just thank you. I can't thank you enough. No, uh, you're a great man. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, all my best to NAMI New York and NAMI uh, across the nation. And I, you know, I will leave you with these words. It's, it's, it's not a lot to just smile at someone and it's so impactful. And I, I've been there, I've isolated. I, I've not returned calls. I actually enjoyed a phone call from a, a friend who had been trying to reach me for over a month and, and left messages and, and didn't give up. And so just be there, even for one person, be yeah. there, be aware, be present and, and be empathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be authentic. <laughs> Be you, baby. That's right. And as we say it all the time, and Nami, you're the embodiment of this. Hope starts with you. So be that one person. You're not just during Mental Illness Awareness Week, but every day. Everyone's struggling Amen. right now. And like Mara said, you can make a difference in the supermarket or, you know, just smile. Even if people can't see your smile, you smile with your eyes. Say hello. Oh, that's new. See? You can smile with your eyes now. Or at least <laughs> maybe the smile is a wave. You're right about seeing it again. You're right. We, we, our smiles have been right. taken away. But so, so what? So it maybe it takes a little more effort, but that effort's worth it because you can really make, you don't know what that person had experienced that day. And just saying, hello, how are you? can really make a big difference. And, and so if you hopefully you take one thing out of this, be the one to make a difference in somebody's life because hope really does start with you. So thank you for watching, Mara. Thank you for everything you do. So appreciative. Love you. And, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Matthew. All righty.